Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's presentation as part of the Industry Insight webinar series. The topic this time is five steps to safeguard your data from cyber threats. Speaking today will be Michael Krieger. The Industry Insight webinar series is hosted by the ABA Legal Technology Resource Center. To stay updated on upcoming webinars or view previous videos, visit ambar.org slash industry insight. You can also stay updated on legal technology news through our blog, www.lawtechnologytoday.org. Michael Krieger is a 45-year IT veteran, cloud computing pioneer, developer, server designer, and industry analyst, analyst with tenures at AST, Hitachi, Ziff Davis, and FutureLink. The presentation today will be followed by a Q&A. Please enter your questions in the, into the question box in the webinar panel that should it be on the right side of your screen. We will address all these questions at the end of this presentation. We are also recording this webinar and we will be sending the video in a follow-up email in a few days. We will also post the video on our blog, which again is www.lawtechnologytoday.org. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll now begin the webinar. Thank you very much, Rose, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me today. I'd also like to thank uh, ABA for making this possible. Uh, I want to talk off, uh, start off today by talking about how the threat landscape is changing, the, the, the various kinds of attack surfaces that are now being exposed because of the way computing is changing. And then we'll talk a little bit about cloud, moving to the cloud and what security is like there, what it was like and what it's turning into. Talk about the issues of mobility, which has been so much a part of cloud computing and yet so much a challenge uh, for the security uh, perspective of it. Uh, considering that, what, about 80% of application, 80% uh, uh, of breaches are due to application uh, code. And we'll talk about how to safeguard your data, your client data, your matters, and some of the side effects of securing by taking a look at a private cloud perspective. It's uh, always interesting to me to talk about the cloud, um, of course. And as Rose said, I've been involved in IT for over 45 years now, which just makes me old, but also lets me take a look at the way that IT has changed. It's kind of been an accordion of centralization and decentralization and centralization again. Uh, when I started as a mainframe developer in the late 60s, early 70s, it, there, everything was cloud-based. We just called it uh, time sharing and mainframes. But that was the way we did computing and then of course over the years we developed local networks, local server farms and then desktop computing. And here we are today using a technology uh, off, offered by a company called Citrix, who is one of the pioneers in bringing us back to that cloud by offering a variety of ways of doing um, a thin client computing or um, of remoting your desktop in some way, which is very much a part of how so much software is delivered today as a service. Of course, the problem is that the way that the business models change now there are all these new attack vectors so the question how do we maintain such security posture and compliance as our IT landscape mobility cloud the internet of everything is changing um, there is a dynamic threat landscape how do we improve our ability to continuously protect against these new attack vectors uh, the way people are um, utilizing um, the information they gain by attacking our systems and this increasing sophistication. Of course, in the beginning, hacking was, wasn't uh, an art. It was something that gave uh, malware writers bragging rights today. It's, it's a uh, much more organized and frightening activity in many ways. So how do we work on these problems of changing business models and attack factors in a dy dynamic threat landscape? and reduce complexity in our environments at the same time. That's the real challenge. So the combination of these dynamics has created a number of security gaps. It's broken the security life cycle and ultimately reduced the visibility um, as well as creating increased complexity and management challenges. So top among these is the need to wrestle with an increasingly aging infrastructure Many organizations and entities still utilize desktop solutions that were crafted for Windows XP or server-based applications running on Windows Server 2003, both of those obsolete and no longer supported at all by Microsoft. Many other entities are utilizing Unix-based systems that are so antiquated that they've outlived their programmers as well as their programming. 
And since the mantra of most IT departments is do more with less, well these days more like do everything with nothing, it's been difficult for many organizations to migrate to the newer software and hardware platforms. Unfortunately, this often results in an IT death spiral. So much time is spent uh, on fighting fires caused by obsolete technology that IT doesn't have the time to be you know, a strategic partner adding bottom line value to the firm. IT instead is you know, just the firefighting mode pretty much all the time. And if you're not a large organization, uh, the problem is even worse. Most smaller firms don't have any IT support at all, much less you know, even bookkeeping or HR in-house. Some have a friend or relative come in to try and balance the books and write the checks. Others rely on the most technically savvy attorney to cobble different pieces of hardware and software into systems that hopefully you know, don't let any matter or accounting related issue fall through the cracks. On top of that, we see, you know, as I mentioned, the industrialization of hacking going from a casual hobby for many into uh, really a business. Uh, and you, we need look no further than uh, the financial institutions who are constantly under attack. I mean, me personally, I've in the past five years had three separate credit cards uh, replaced by my providers because of breaches and you all know what a pain that is just you know for the automatic payments and you know everything that you use to uh, to go through that issue and to have it happen you know three times in a few years I don't think is is so abnormal anymore it's it's becoming uh, more and more the norm so you have that industrialization of hacking you combine that with aging infrastructure that is no longer receiving a security updates from Microsoft and you can see a combination uh, of, of factors that can lead to a perfect storm when it comes to security breaches. If you think about the way security has evolved, you know, it began within the perimeter. So if you're inside the perimeter, you know, you're trusted. If you're outside, you're untrusted. Well, that worked for a long time, but it's clearly not working today because many people are outside the network. They're on any device, they're accessing any application, and in many different clouds. Uh, that information is, is being accessed you know, through a data center, through public clouds, and through hybrid clouds, a combination of both public and, and private. And more often than not, we're seeing uh, the term private cloud being applied even to individual data centers. Of course, um, the whole thing about cloud is you ask five people what, what it means, and you'll get six different answers. So anyway, what we have here is an any-to-any -any problem, and it has increased the points and ways in which hackers are getting in, all these devices coming in through all these different entry and exit points. So many more attorneys and paralegals are finding themselves you know, chained to their PCs for data entry and practice management, time tracking software, even email. But in today's highly mobile and social climate where tablets and smartphones you know, just seem to fall out of every pocket in the Taché case, you know, today's legal practitioners want to utilize their own devices both to access information on the go and increasingly to create and input information from anywhere, whether it's in their homes, their courtrooms, their boardroom, you know, and they want to do that with the same ease and efficiency of using their desktop or laptop computer. It's just absolutely common today to see tablets replacing what the traditional use of desktop and laptop computers. And of course, for the last two years, um, devices like tablets and smartphones are outselling personal computers and laptops by a wide margin um, and more and more to uh, just underlying the reason the the excitement that we have from moving into uh, this BYOD world so how do you make that move how, what do you do to secure your information well the first part of taking a look at securing your critical matters and um, safeguarding your data from cyber thefts is a continuous activity process that should be assessment. Every organization is different so the decision as to what kind of risk assessment has to be formed depends largely on you know your specifics. If for example it's determined that all your organization needs at this time is just general to prioritize uh, a simplified approach to an enterprise security risk assessment can be taken and even if it's already been determined that a more in-depth assessment has to be completed, 
A simplified approach can be a helpful first step in generating an overview to guide your decision making in pursuit of that more in-depth assessment. So if you're not sure what kind of assessment you, you need, a simplified assessment can help make that determination. Uh, if you find it's impossible to produce accurate results in the process of completing a simplified assessment, maybe because the process doesn't t take into account a detailed enough set of assessment factors, I mean this also alone can be helpful in determining what you really need, uh, what you really need to do. And of course, here are some of the things. Number one, identify the business needs first of all and changes to requirements that can affect your overall IT and security direction. Um, do you have to deal with, um, for example, outdated and, and obsolete equipment and operating systems that need support? Um, take a look at the data repositories where your information is stored and take a look at the uh, adequacy of existing security policies, security standards, guidelines and procedures, if they are even in place. Once you analyze those assets, then you have to take a look at the threats and vulnerabilities, including their impacts and likelihood. What happens if a piece of information gets uncovered, exposed, or um, exfiltrated um, from your network? Have to assess the physical protection applied to your computing equipment. Um, it are, is the um, data in a secured facility? Is, is the um, storage closet, or is there a data center that's locked and has um, physical security, whether it's as uh, simple as a key code or as complicated as biometric security, depending on the sophistication that you require. Uh, by conducting technical and procedural reviews and analyses of the various network architectures, protocols, and components, you can ensure that they're also implemented according to the security policies that you have in place or hopefully have in place. Uh, your assessment should review and check the configuration, the implementation and usage of remote access systems, remote servers of firewalls and external network connections, including uh, the client internet connections. And of course, reviewing the logical access and other authentication mechanisms, are they tied into uh, an active directory, for example, a central uh, identification and access management system? Is it separate from um, what's used to log on to uh, for applications and networks? All that needs to be taken into account. By reviewing the current level of security awareness and commitment of the staff within the organization, that's a, a huge step as well because uh, for many, um, security is an afterthought. It's I got to get my work done, I'll worry about security later. It has to be baked in through all levels of the organization and that's kind of a top-down thing. And then, of course, there are all the outside uh, vendors and contractors who you work with. You, you have to review your agreements involving services or products from them. Are they secure? Is, are you taking every step? Are they taking every step to secure your information if it uh, leaves your network and goes to theirs, for even if they're working on contracts or what have you? Um, you know, ultimately, you have to develop practical, technical recommendations to address all of these vulnerabilities identified and reduce the level of security um, security impact. So we'll take a look at what of that what that can mean. Start off um, by taking an impact assessment, and this also known as impact analysis or a consequence assessment, estimates the degree of overall harm or loss that could occur as a result of the exploitation of any particular security vulnerability. Quantifiable elements of the impact are those on revenues, profits, costs, service levels, regulations, and perhaps most importantly, reputation. It's also important to consider the level of risk that can be tolerated and how what, what, what assets could be affected by such risks. And the more severe the consequences of a threat, the higher the risk. For example, if the prices in a document are compromised, the cost to the organization could be the lost profit from that contract and the lost load on other systems with a percentage likelihood of winning that contract if you know, another firm is bidding on the same contract as yours. Then there's a likelihood ass assessment. So a likelihood assessment estimates the probability of one of those threats occurring. In this type of assessment, it's uh, necessary to determine the circumstances that could affect the likelihood of that risk actually occurring. And normally, the likelihood increases with the number of authorized users, for example. 
And that can be expressed in terms of the frequency of occurrence, such as, you know, once a day, once a month, once a year. The greater the likelihood of a particular threat occurring, the higher the risk. And it can be hard to really quantify likelihood for many different parameters. Therefore, you know, likelihood can be employed as, as a ranking, for example. And, uh, for example, to illustrate that, um, the relative likelihood in a geographical area of an earthquake, a hurricane, or a tornado, you know, ranked in descending order. So there are those issues which, of course, also can impact security and, and uh, access to data. A systems example is the high likelihood of an attempt to exploit a new vulnerability in, to an installed operating system as soon as it's published, a zero-day threat, as they're sometimes called. If the system affected is classified as critical, the impact is also high. So as a re result, the risk of this threat is high as well. For each of those identified risks, its impact and likelihood must be determined to give an overall estimation, uh, estimated level of that risk, and assumptions could be clearly defined when making that estimation. This uh, two-dimensional measurement of risk makes for an easy visual representation of the conclusions of that assessment, as you see in front of you. So let's get down to it and talk about what it is you can do to actually um, reduce the your threat profile to safeguard your data from cyber threats. Um, step one, probably first and foremost, establishing an information security governance policy. It's almost impossible to successfully manage an information security program without proper governance structure. Governance will ensure that security program is aligned with the business objectives, that information risk is effectively managed, resources are properly utilized, and coordination exists among stakeholders inside the organization. When you're thinking about governance, at minimum, start with establishing a security steering committee comprised of business and technology stakeholders. Establishing the roles and a reporting structure also helps in governance. Step two, create an information security strategy. So a strategy that aligns with business goals is critical to the success of the program. All parts of the information security strategy have to map to one or more business goals. And once that strategy is established and approved by senior management or whoever the stakeholders are, create a roadmap for a couple of years out to implement that strategy. How do you get from point A to point B? Step three, risk and compliance management. So every organization has to create a risk management process within the information security program. In addition to general security risk management, many organizations have to comply with some government or industry standard. Compliance is an essential part of overall risk management, as you know, and the risk and compliance management has to include a risk assessment methodology and management of risk at all levels of people, processes, and of course the various technology that's involved, best return on investment for managing risk, really just educating the workforce and particularly the users into what happens if they don't follow procedures can, um, can save a lot of headaches. So step four, the actual security operations, day-to-day -day operations include managing security technologies, log reviews, change control processes, identification administration, patching, and so on. Um, if you're doing that in a cloud, a cloud security program could include these functions and integrate these functions in an overall corporate information security program. And using metrics really is essential to measure the effectiveness of security operations and to make tweaks for improvements. And you know, the metrics are probably going to be different for every organization, but based on the, the business model and your governance needs that you set up uh, in the previous steps. And then finally, last but not least, no organization is going to be immune to security incidents. Comprehensive and tested incident response plan is essential for your information risk management program. It's prudent to establish processes for first responders, forensic investigation, evidence preservation, communication, and business continuity. And in many cases, an organization may not have in-house resources for forensic in investigation. In many cases, organizations may not have in-house IT support to a large extent. So a pre-established contract with an external forensic firm can be helpful in the case of a major incident. So, you know, to conclude, really, these, these steps, 
an established information security management program is essential to manage information risk. Operations, compliance, and incident response, all of these. The program should enable the business through proper governance, should control costs of security incidents, and establish a culture of information security in any organization. But you know, I'm going to say something radical here and you know, go go going back to the cloud. Why not remove all the attack vendors and make it someone else's problem altogether? And you know, this is one of the great things about private cloud solutions, such as that offer, offered by uh, today's sponsor, Abacus. By eliminating the technology on site, the networking hassles, and migrating to a private cloud, which is focused on legal solutions. Um, you can do shift all of these burdens to a team of technologists who do nothing but this and um, and worry about the business of law instead. Um, you know, there's no desire, I'm sure, in your organization, especially smaller organizations, to become security experts. None of us are um, really want to worry about the technology at all. What we want to worry about is getting our work done and uh, ensuring the safety and timeliness of the work products that uh, our attorneys are doing and our staff is doing. So by moving to a private cloud solution such as um, Abacus offers, what you find is uh, a couple of interesting side effects. First of all, you've eliminated the issues uh, the, the attack vectors in the first place, the major ones being, of course, that aging infrastructure on premises. Uh, number two, you've also enabled access from virtually any device anywhere, um, as private cloud solutions support iOS, Android, Windows, Mac clients. It really doesn't matter what the client is. Basically, any web browser can successfully access all of your information, whether it's client data, whether it's matter data, et cetera. It's available. Uh, there, it's also available anytime and anywhere. So as long as you've got an internet connection, uh, you, you have a secure connection to that data. It's uh, safely encrypted while it's on site. It's um, not being stored on end user devices. So again, uh, it's it's completely safe and stored. And uh, even better, private cloud providers um, they they handle backup and recovery. They handle business continuity issues. So you solved that problem as well with a single, with a single blow. So um, what I tried to do here is out, outline the steps that you need to secure your information on your site and also take a look at some of the side effects that you can have, some of the benefits you'll see by eliminating technology management as an issue and moving to a, a, a private cloud infrastructure as a result.